objective of this video is to show you how to make this particular bread during the cold winter months. And I want to share with you on how I do it when we are having blistery cold days in Canada. Before we start this video, I just want to put this out there that this is not just a recipe video, but it's also an explanation video. So for those of you who just want the recipe portion and don't care about the explanation portion, please follow the timestamp down below and you can forward it ahead to it. For those who are interested in the explanation portion, let's just start from here. Really, it's meant for anyone who is trying to make this particular bread during cold days and they're finding that the proofing is just taking way too long which does end up lending to a more sour taste in the end. There is no secret, it's just I want to show you what I do to prevent the building of that sourness taste within the bread. It's great if you're making more of the European style traditional sourdough bread if you want that tangy flavor but in this particular bread which is shokupan or Japanese milk bread, you don't want that sour taste. You want it to be slightly sweet, more tender, fluffy, kind of like North America's Wonder Bread, but this being Japanese milk bread. And this is the bread that we like to make at home in lieu of a store-bought Wonder Bread. Hi everyone, welcome back to our channel. Um, and we are here to show you how we make Japanese milk bread. Now, um, if you will just excuse me, uh, I'm feeling a little under the weather and probably fitting considering we're talking about cold winter days. <clears throat> so my voice may be a little bit raspy now and then. By the time you watch this video, it's probably warmer days and you're wondering why I bother making this bread, but we really still want to share this video with you so that when you do encounter cold days and you want to make this bread, there are some steps you can follow to ensure that you you know, it may not be the exact same tall, fluffy bread that you see on some other people's videos, but still end up having a delicious bread with a tender, soft crumb that you can, you know, spread your peanut butter and jam on. And my favorite is to toast it and actually put butter and jam. Now, when I started making this bread or attempting to, um, by the way, I still make regular sourdough bread. It's tasty, but uh, we sometimes wanted more of a softer bread to be able to spread spreads on and it's sometimes tricky on a regular sourdough bread to do that because at times the holes are big and things kind of fall off and um, it's not the most tender crusted bread. So when I started trying to make this about three years ago um, I watched as many videos as I could because you know YouTube University or University of YouTube and I was finding that those videos were made or being done from places that are a lot warmer with more humidity. So the proofing time that they were indicating worked for them, but just was not working for me. In the summer months, I don't have that much of a problem, but in the winter months, I find it is really, really tough to proof this bread in time to make sure that it doesn't gain that more sour taste inside of it without having to add more sugar. And I did actually try adding more sugar to combat the sourness, knowing that my proofing time was taking longer. It just ended up being a really sour, tangy, sugary taste, which may not be a bad thing, but that's not the flavor profile I was looking for. And I was reading through the comments of those videos and I would see the same comments from other people of the pain that I was dealing with. They were finding instead of, you know, four hours to uh, proof on the second proof, their proofing time would be seven to nine hours, which is what was um, becoming as part of my problem. And even when I would wait seven to nine hours for, for it to proof, it still wouldn't rise the way it should or does in those videos. So that was an issue. I do want to clarify my sourdough starter, which is what I'm been wanting to use for this type of bread is very strong. It's about four years old now, still going, still does a great job, but for this particular bread, it just, the cold was a huge, huge factor. No matter what I did, it just was not turning out. It was getting to the point where I was starting to feel a little disheartened, but I didn't want to quite give up yet. I just, I'm one of those people where 
I want to figure out why is it a problem, what's happening, what are they doing that seems to work for them, aside from the environment which I can't control living where I am living. So what can I do in terms of modification through experimentation to at least get it close to what they have and still be a very enjoyable bread? It may not be Instagram worthy, which I don't really care about. I just want it to be fluffy, soft, tender, slightly sweet, very enjoyable, and to the point where, you know, we look forward to having this bread whenever we want to have it. Now, yes, you can make this bread with just instant yeast, and that will probably guarantee a proper proofing time, but I want to use the sourdough starter. Reason being is because it's better for my gut. I digest the bread a lot better with it. That's the whole point why I went down to the sourdough journey. So I wanted to figure out what I could do to make this work for me. And after all those trials and tribulations, I finally got the bread I wanted. And here's how I did it. Now for sourdough purists, please don't hate me. Please don't come at me too hard in the comments down below if you do decide to. Um, this, you may find this disturbing what I decided to end up doing. I decided to combine both the sourdough starter and a little bit of instant yeast to help at least get the process going and get to the proofing time that I need to make this bread on extremely cold days. I, I'm sure some people already do that. It's not real big of a secret, but some people may be shy in mentioning that. I'm gonna go ahead and say it because I want folks who may not be familiar with this, wanna be able to make this bread and not feel intimidated by it. And I'm not talking adding like a teaspoon of instant yeast with a sourdough starter. No, I'm talking like a pinch, anywhere four to nine granules. I literally just take a little bit out of the jar that I have of instant yeast, and I just drop a little bit in there. And majority of the times it works. Now, when we were recording and making the recipe portion of this video, we were encountering even colder days, colder than any of the other years that we've had. So it still wouldn't rise the way it was supposed to. And that happens. I mean, you're never going to get perfect bread every time, but you are going to get fantastic tasting bread every time. And I made it three times. I was stuck in my head. I wanted to show you a tall, fluffy loaf. And it just, you know, it wasn't quite tall. Definitely was not short. But, you know, I wish it was taller so I could be proud of what I was showing to you guys. But anyways, um, I just add a few granules with my giant portion of Levan of my sourdough starter for making this bread. I say Levan because I actually keep a what I like to call a mother starter in the fridge separate and then I just take a portion out of that use it as inoculation to make the Levan for this bread or any bread that I make anytime. Reason being is because if something goes wrong at least my mother starter is still good. And if the Levan goes bad for whatever reason, I can just throw it out. If you're curious about sourdough starters, I actually have a Skillshare course. I can provide a link down below if you have membership with Skillshare. I do a full breakdown on how to make sourdough starters and how to use them to manipulate the taste and the tanginess of your bread. I did this quite a bit while I was selling bread for about a year for clients when they wanted either more sourness in their bread or less sourness in their bread. It's not just about making a starter. It's also about how you can use the starter to manipulate flavors and what you want to achieve. So if you're interested in that course, the link will be down below. Now, if you're encountering where just a pinch of instant yeast is not working, um, you can add more. You'll need to experiment and see what works best for you. Uh, where we live, we don't actually have any insulation in the building. Um, it's more of a concrete building, so when it gets cold, it gets really cold. I even added less than half a teaspoon of instant yeast to my bread dough, and it still wasn't quite rising as much as I hoped it would for the purpose of this video. Still was a very tasty bread. It's okay to use instant yeast with your sourdough starter. It's still a sourdough starter based bread so in terms of digestion it'll all the benefits will still be there but you know it never hurts to have a little help along the way and it's not we're not we're not talking like a little bit of difference by adding a couple of granules of it instant yeast 
we're talking a huge difference. It was huge for me when I first finally decided after a year and a half of experimenting to just go ahead and add that little bit of instant yeast and it rose quite a bit and it stuck more or less to the proofing time that were suggested in these other videos that I was watching. I was extremely pleased. Another method to use to help in um, the process of making this bread to ensure you get good proofing time, and I know people already do this, is using the oven light in your oven. Now on really cold days, what I do is I turn the oven on at 150 degrees Fahrenheit. That's the lowest setting on our oven for about three minutes or so with the oven light on. After those two to three minutes, I turn it off and that way it just um, enables the oven to become warmer faster. Because it's so cold in our house, that's the method I've chosen. For those who may not feel confident in remembering to turn the oven off, maybe don't use this method. It's just I like to get the day going and, and as soon as I start mixing the dough, I want to ensure that my oven is warm and ready for at least the first proof. Most of the time I don't need to like kind of preheat the oven so to speak, but if it's really cold and I can tell that my oven itself is very cold when I touch it, I turn it on for a little bit. Do it at your own discretion. Now the third thing I want to talk to you about is a dough improver. There are two methods. There is the Tangzong method and then the Yudane. I use the Yudane method because I am lazy and I didn't realize the benefits of Yudane until I started doing more research on it later on. I just saw someone using it and I said, okay, I'm gonna try it. And it worked. I, I, the funny thing is, the first time when I was making the bread for this video, I actually forgot to add the yudane. So the second time when I made it, I made sure to add yudane and I decided that this would be a great time to do a comparison between two doughs, one with and one without a dough improver. So then, what is a dough improver? no matter which method you decide to use. A dough improver ensures that your dough retains moisture so that it doesn't become stale too quickly, enabling it to have a longer shelf life. Now, through some readings, I, I noticed that people were mentioning that the Yudane method is better for longer shelf life than Tanzong. How do you make a Yudane versus a Tanzong? A Yudane is a method where you either scorch or scald the flour, and that changes the structure of the flour, making it more gelatinous. What do I mean by scorching or scalding? You're adding hot water to the flour and then mixing it in a bowl. Tangzong is a method where you're kind of making a roux in a pot and heating the water and the dough together till it changes properties. And then you let it cool down and then you add it to your dough when mixing. Yudane is a one-to-one -one portion, one part flour, one part water. Tanzong is one to five, ideally, sometimes four, depending on what you're doing and how much hydration you need. It's one part flour, five parts water. The key for the Yudane though, if you're gonna be doing that method, which is the method that I will be showing you, um, make it the night before, that way it has the whole night in the fridge to rest and basically embrace its gelatinous lifestyle, so to speak, in preparation to making the dough. Now let's look at the comparisons between the dough that had yudane versus the dough that didn't. On the right is the bread that has the yudane added to it. And on the left is the bread where I forgot to add it. Don't uh, mind the height difference between the two breads. That's not what the dough improver is really about. That's just, I was having difficulty because it was so cold. It's more in terms of the textural differences and the moisture retention. The one without the yudane is about, I only have one pan to make this particular bread, so I couldn't do a side by side at the same time. But you can see that the one bread that's about a day older is the one without the yudane, and the one with the yudane was left overnight to rest once it was baked. You can see already a stale ring forming on the one without the dough improver. 
and you can also see that it's slightly stiffer when I press down on it. The one with the dough improver is a lot softer. Even when I press my finger down on it, it still leaves an indentation versus the one without the dough improver. It's also, it was, I don't know why I did this, but I want to do like a floppy test. And you'll see the one with a dough improver is a lot floppier. It's because it's much more of a moist bread versus the one that doesn't have the dough improver. So it's, it's, like, it's like waving around cardboard almost with it. And even when I try to bend the slices, the one with the dough improver is nice and supple, so it won't really crack. Whereas the one without it, it actually cracked the instant I bent it. And I didn't even apply that much of a pressure to it. So there are different properties. I do want to point out, both are extremely delicious breads. Just because one doesn't have the dough improver does not make it a less tastier bread. But it does make a textural difference. So if you don't care about that texture difference, but you love having a really, really dry toast, make the bread without the dough improver. If you love a moist bread and you want to have a longer shelf life, if you're someone who likes to leave their bread out, make sure then to add the dough improver. What I like is that I like my toast, my bread, to have a little bit of a bite. It's like a little slight chew when you bite down on the bread. And it has that, for the lack of the better word, a slight toothiness when you bite down on it. And you can see with the toast slices here, one with and one without, is that the one without, when I, when I pressed into it, um, you could tell, you can see the air pockets from the crumb right away versus the one with the dough improver on the right. The crumb is very tight and it's kind of pillowy when I press, it's almost like a marshmallow when I press into it. You can see the, the difference in the properties right there. For Rob, he said he couldn't really tell a difference, but I know me because I'm all about those little textures. I could notice a difference between the two of them. The other thing I noticed was um, I toasted both slices at the same um, time parameter. And the one without the dough improver actually toasted a little more evenly, darker and was definitely crunchier or crispier versus the one with the dough improver where it didn't quite um, toast evenly and you can see where it's toastier it's more around the edges and that's because there's so much more moisture in the center of the bread in the crumb area um, and it didn't get quite as dark I could have toasted it for longer for my personal preference but for the purpose of this comparison I want to keep the time parameter the same for both slices so we could see uh, what they look like when I bit into them The one without the dough improver is definitely a lot crispier, crunchier, and crumblier. Like if you run a knife across it, you can see it's giving off a lot more crumb. Whereas the one with the dough improver, it's crispy, it's very nice. And again, I like a little bit of a marshmallowy spring in the center of my toast. Um, it's, it is crumbly, but not as much as the dry toast. And thankfully that also means that I won't choke on the toast, which I was finding a little bit with the one without the dough improver. It just Mm. Um, the crumbs were getting a little dry in the back of my throat. Now, if you're dealing with a very cold day, when you make the yudane uh, the night before, leave it in the fridge, let it rest overnight. The next day, when you're getting ready to mix your dough, pull the yudane out of the fridge for a little bit, maybe half an hour or so, I'll let it come to slight room temperature. This way then it won't affect the overall temperature of the dough itself. And it also goes for milk. I tend to leave my milk out for a little bit, my measured milk for the purpose of the dough so that it's more room temperature and it won't affect the temperature of inside the dough, which would then affect the proofing time. The fourth thing that I changed in my Japanese milk bread making process, I realized I was actually using the wrong flour. I was using bread flour initially. The bread still turned out delicious, it still turned out soft, but I felt like it could be more soft, more tender. When I went back to watch those videos again of the lovely ladies making Japanese milk bread, um, 
I realized they kept saying they were using bread flour, but they would also mention that the percentage of their bread flour is only about 11%. And they were using Japanese flour and the Japanese flour is only about 11, maybe 12%, which is basically all purpose flour for us here in North America. Our bread flours here tend to be much stronger in gluten and protein. So after making this bread, over and over with regular bread flour, I decided to try all-purpose flour. And this is the all-purpose flour that I like to use. Brand doesn't make too much of a difference. It only depends on, it really depends on what they add to it. Um, if there's any additional things that they add to it that may influence the making of the bread during the proofing times. But, you know, use whatever all-purpose flour you want to use or have access to. All-purpose flour for us in North America is about between 10 to 12 percent, depending on what you get. And that, when I change from bread flour to regular all-purpose flour, Game changer. It turned out a lot more supple, a lot more tender, a lot softer, and just you kind of want to like hug the bread and squish the daylights out of it, but you don't want to because you worked so hard in making this bread. It just, it was a lot better. Even the outside crumb uh, was a lot more, it wasn't so dry where you want to cut the edges off. I know some people like to trim the edge of the bread. I don't know why, I think it's a waste, but it stayed nice and soft. And for toast, which is how we normally have it as, it was perfect. It's nice and thin. It was it was just great and even the crumb texture inside was looking a lot better it was a lot tighter not very many um different sized holes it looked a lot more uniform it also helped in uh the rising of the bread i found that the breads were actually rising even taller on good days and i guess that could be because a bread flour even though it's sifted is still a little bit uh, heavier because it's not as sifted as an all-purpose flour all-purpose flour being much lighter, uh, little to nothing of the grain of the outer germ or anything like that. It was a lot taller and fluffier. So whatever brand of all-purpose flour you have, I would say give it a try. You may see a difference if you were using or were thinking of using bread flour. Uh, let's talk about this pan. Now, I'm, I'll provide a link to the pan that I bought about three years ago. I noticed when I uh, found that link again, it says that it's unavailable. So I'll provide a second link where it looks like the same pan around the same price that I paid three years ago. They're calling it Pullman pan. When I was first looking at it, it actually said Chocopan pan. Say that three times. And I'm not sure how this is a Pullman pan, but it is taller than your regular bread pan and uh, not as long. So it's like a stubbier version of a bread pan that enables more of a height when the bread is proofing. You can bake with the lid on or without. I like to bake it without the lid because I want the bread to rise even taller past the height of the pan. But if you want to have a perfectly squared shaped bread, leave the lid on and it'll be great. And there are three holes at the bottom of the pan, so for you to bake with the lid on is not a problem. There's areas for the steam to release. Now I'm going to be looking at my notes quite a bit here because there are some key points I want to go over with you which I um, came across where I feel like it's best to share in case you come across them as well. Now for best results, to ensure your dough has everything that it needs, the strength that it needs to retain the gas while it's proofing, is to make sure you knead the dough properly in the machine. I wouldn't really do this by hand, it's going to be a lot of work, especially because you'll be incorporating room temperature butter into the dough. Before you add the butter, make sure the dough, when it's kneading in the machine, You'll see it starts to separate from the sides and from the bottom. That's a good indication where you can start doing a window pane test. Before you add the butter, make sure you do a window pane test. The reason I'm stressing this is because I didn't the number of times when I was initially making this bread and it would never be that strong of a dough. 
Now for the window pane test, it doesn't need to be a perfect window pane where you, you know, you touch your finger to it and ensure it doesn't rip. If it rips a little, that's fine. It just means that you're starting to build the proper strength, that it's not pulling apart right away as soon as you start to pick up the dough. You just want to be able to pick up the dough, do a rough window pane test, and if it's still holding, you're good. Now you can start incorporating the butter. When you're incorporating the butter, add a little bit at a time and only put in the next butter when the first one has been fully incorporated into the dough. What I mean by fully incorporated, you don't really see it when the dough is being kneaded in the machine. And again, same thing, once all the butter has been added and once the dough finally starts to release from the sides and from the bottom, start doing a window pane test. And in this window pane test, the second time around, you do want to make sure that it's holding the pain when you're running your finger across it, that it's not tearing. If it's not tearing, you have kneaded a proper dough. Now, no one mentioned this in any of the videos that I was watching, and I don't know, maybe it's common sense for most people, and I was having, you know, a lapse in intelligence, I don't know what. When you're doing the first window pane test before you've added the butter, you can check the dough by wetting your hands with water. I'm going somewhere with this. When you're doing the second window pane test after you've added the butter, make sure you handle the dough with oil on your fingers, not water. I made the mistake of using water or wetting my fingers with water when checking the second window pane after the butter was added. And where I touched the dough, I could feel it start to fall apart. I still ended up having great bread made, but I could feel it fall apart. And it's like, oh, oil and water don't mix, mm, that kind of thing. So the first window pane test before you add any fat to it, like a butter, use water to check it. As soon as you add the butter and any time after that, whenever you're handling dough, start just using oil. Don't use water at all. The water will start to break the dough down. It's not the best feeling when you can feel it happening. It's kind of weird. So the proofing times um, between the first and the second proofing are different. And during the first proof, after you're finished making the dough and it's resting, let it proof for two hours and you'll see it almost double in size. The second proofing time, best for best performance in terms of flavor is four hours. Now, I know from personal experience, because I've made this bread so many times, once I've hit the five hour mark and even if the dough has not risen where it, I want it to be at, I still go ahead and bake the bread because if I go past a five hour mark, it starts to uh, take on a more sour taste. If you don't mind that little bit of sour taste and you want the dough to rise higher or taller, keep proofing if you want. But if you don't want that sour taste, but your dough has still not risen where it should be, I would say go ahead and bake it off. It won't be a really tall bread, but it won't be a stub either. You'll still have a good height to it and you'll avoid any sourness developing in the bread. I check the dough for the second proofing at the four hour mark and if I see that it's risen but it's not rising at the speed that it should, I start preheating the oven. Make sure you take the dough out, by the way. Don't leave the dough in the oven for proofing. I preheat the oven so that it has about 40, 45 minutes to get hot and then I put the dough in to bake. I would say experiment. It's probably going to be different in your kitchen. You know, it may take a few trials, but you can figure out where for your flour in your kitchen environment, if it's proofing at the four hour mark and it is where it's at, great. If not, you can decide if you want to bake it off or not. Now, when I say height uh, in terms of when it's proofing, it's when it reaches about 80 or 90% in height inside the bread pan. That's the proper proofing height for uh, it to be baked at at that point. The great thing about this bread, any sourdough bread, honestly, um, it freezes well. So when we bake the bread, we don't eat bread every day, but we like to have this bread around in case we decide I would love a toast this morning for my peanut butter and jam. So I freeze the whole loaf and whenever we want it, you can actually easily slice it while it's frozen and then toast it if that's how you want it. If you want to keep it around on your shelf or in a bread pan, 
should be fine if you like it in that warm temperature because you want to just use it as a sandwich bread. But for those of us who just toast, I say keep it frozen and it still tastes fresh every time. And we've had it frozen for two, maybe sometimes even three months and it's still great. Because we made three breads for this video, they're all in the freezer. I think we did finish one though already, but it'll keep. And that's the beautiful thing about this bread. So those are some of the things that I wanted to point out, explanation portion of this video. I hope it was insightful, um, as it was for me while I was going through all these um, times, experimenting, making it, and finally be happy in being able to replicate the process. The struggle for me before was I couldn't replicate the process where it was giving me good results, but I was definitely replicating the process where it continuously gave me bad results. At least it was consistent in that regards. But I wanted to get to a point where if I make it again and again and again, I can still be happy with what I'm making. I hope you try it out. And if you do, I would love to know how it turned out. Um, it's one of those where you may have to experiment with your kitchen and see what you come up with. I'd be curious to know. But we can now go into the recipe portion of the video, the recipe that I've made after watching all these videos that is my own that has worked for me and I hope, I hope that it works for you. It's not major changes from other people's recipes, but it's modifications here and there, which I found helped me with those little modifications to a much, much better and greater result. So let's go to the recipe portion of this video and thank you for watching. We really, really appreciate it. And thank you always for the great comments that people leave.